And turn to your neighbor and just say, it ain't worth worrying about. It ain't worth worrying about. It ain't worth worrying about. Most times I listen to my wife. Periodically I, I hesitate. Years ago, um, there was Disney had a movie out, The Lion King, and Marilyn's always wanted me to preach a sermon from The Lion King, simply entitled, Akuna Matata. And uh, I never have. Um, but it, uh, it's important for us just to, uh, to in, enjoy the Lord in our life and, and to cast our cares over on Him and live life in a way that demonstrates His Lordship over us. When we worry, we, are, we stop worshiping the Lord. And in a sense, we start worshiping the problems around us. We don't like to say it that way. But sometimes we, we need it put in a, in a confronted way like that. And we keep our trust and our confidence over on the Lord. And, uh, and, and I want you to know you can trust the Lord. I want you to know you, you can trust the Lord. Not just your pastor, not just a few people, but you can trust the Lord. Uh, pastor, how do I know if I can trust Jesus? Because Jesus came to this earth for you. Because Jesus confronted temptations and all that the enemy threw at him for us. We can trust him because we know he died on the cross to pay for our sins that we hadn't even committed yet. We know we can trust him because we know he went to hell and paid the penalty of, of death for us. And was raised victorious over death, hell, and the grave for us. We can trust him because we know what he's already done for us. Not just a promise of what he might do in the future. That's where real confidence comes. That's where real loyalty comes into our lives. And that's why it's so important for us to remember that we are not following a religion. We are not following some nicely crafted philosophical or theological um, um, just theories and concepts that are brought together. We're not just following a set of rules that nice people and good people do. We are following a Savior. We are following the Lord Jesus Christ, who has already paid such a great debt and has already sacrificed so much for us. We're not following a politician who is promising to make our life better. We're following a Savior who already paid so our lives can be great along the way. So that releases within us confidence. It releases not just hope, but it releases courage on the inside of us to follow after Jesus. We should be the most courageous individuals on this earth because we're following after someone who has already done everything that needs to be done to make our lives better here on this earth, but for eternity he has paid a price so that we can have, have faith and favor in him for eternity in our lives. That's why we're saying we're not following after some religion. We're following after the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, in our lives. Amen? And we're having a good time doing it. We might have some obstacles. Anybody got obstacles? It amazes me, people that run obstacle courses, like they ain't got enough obstacles in their life. They got to make some and put them all in a line and line up and wait to be able to do it. Like, that sounds like getting out of bed in the morning to me. But uh, following Jesus. This week's been an incredible week at Grandview, and I want to say thank you again for this church. Um, I, am, I am, again, humbled for the privilege of being your pastor. Um, to see the incredible work that you've been able to do. Many of you, all of you know, we went through VBS. We went through. We, we had the privilege of having VBS this last week. Started on Sunday night this, with the sessions through, through Thursday night. But, but it started way before that. Um, the amount of work that went into it was incredible. Um, so appreciate those that came in for weeks ahead of time and cutting out um, um, crafts and getting things together and spending time in the office there. It was wonderful um, just to be able to hear the voices and the relationships that were being built in the other room as they were putting things together and laughing and joking and, and just getting things together for VBS there. The amount of time for the skits and the, and the t lessons that were, were prepared and went into it is incredible. 
I, I just want to thank you. Every night, Graham View, I went home, uh, Marilyn and I went home about, usually about 9.30 at night, e- exhausted and overjoyed to be able to see what we were do- able to be a part of. Um, it took, uh, I think we had 80 workers involved in VBS. It, that's, that's twice as many people that was in Grandview when, when we came a few years back. Uh, it's incredible to be able to see. And those were just those that, you know, they're kind of on the face. But, but we had everyone from people cutting out crafts to driving buses to, uh, to being involved in, in the games, teaching the lessons. Um, it was just amazing all the different individuals that were involved in. Ladies down in the kitchen cooking. They cooked over 1,800 cookies this last week. And they're gone. <laughs> so, and there was the cookie testers that were down there. And, and, um, and, and, and maybe that's where part of the 1,800 went. I'm not for sure there. But, uh, but just an incredible time uh, that we had. I had uh, over 150 different children that came through. About 100 every night that were here. That we were able to reach into their lives. And it was an incredible opportunity to remind us. But just how many hurting individuals that there are around us. How many, how, many, how many people that just need loved. How many children that you just need to just, that just wanted to be hugged on. Just wanted to be, be just to physically to be reminded about that someone cares about them and loves them. How many kids that are common would learn Bible verses that we're able to teach them every night and get that word of God on the inside of them and, and that would come that regardless of who they were that they could grow ge- deeper in Christ Jesus and know the Lord more in their lives. And what a blessing it was. Every night when they would do some kind of an altar call, kids would come forward. Every single night. Well, Pastor, that one kid came forward several times. Some of you need to come forward a little more regular too. <laughs> some people say, well, 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 didn't it take the first time I just believe that every time they come forward, they were just sensing the Holy Spirit, and they knew they needed to do something in their lives. Would to God we had more childlike faith that felt God and felt like I needed to do something than us good adults that can pretend like, no, he ain't speaking to me. No, he must be talking to someone else because I'm all straight. So it was an incredible time. And, of course, it took amazing uh, in leadership, uh, Heather uh, and her family that, that came and, and drove distances, and many of you that drove along and been here, I know many of you work all day and then came in that night and slapped a smile on your face and let the love of Jesus overflow in you. And it was just, it was just you guys got an A plus um, every single night in what you, you did and how many lives were able to touch and influence and, and then families that were able to reach out to. The carnival, of course, that we did on Thursday night over here was... It was a great time just to be able to mingle around and be with the people and be with the kids and just to meet their families a little bit more and get to talking with them. And so it was just, it was just incredible. And it couldn't have happened without all of us working together to make it happen. Couldn't happen, of course, without the Lord's presence. But, but this is the amazing thing about God. He works through people. And so he needs willing people to work through. And so I just want to say thank you uh, again for, for all of those. I could ask people to stand that were involved in it, um, but that would be many of you and, and some of them that aren't here. It would kind of leave them out. But again, uh, some of those special ones like, like Heather that, that took the lead on this one, we certainly appreciate her and the ministry that she was able to do and help us along this way. But it was, it was a lot of, of work that was worth it to be able to touch in these lives. So thank you. Thank you, Grandview. Every night, young lives were touched by God. And even some of the stories from you, uh, some of you that were started to get irritated at times about something, and then the Holy Spirit would use one of those little children to share a testimony with you, and you would be melted um, in realizing what God was doing. Some people want to know, well, well, how many came? How many came forward? How many? And And I understand that God is interested in numbers. But I think on some of these events, as the Holy Spirit moves and he starts to work in people's lives, that it's, it's not just how many, but how much. How much 
is a question that maybe we should be asking ourselves as we go forward in ministry. How much? How much prayer did we put in it beforehand? How much preparation with expectation were we involved in? How much will it cost us personally, not just the church financially, as we go forward and we do ministry such as this? How much love and how much of God's word can we get into their lives when we meet with those little children or meet with people on a regular basis? I think how much is a whole lot better question than how many. Now, I realize that God wants us to, to reach as many as we can. But if we reach a bunch, but we don't put much in them, we haven't done much. But Jesus took a few guys, and he put a lot in them, and then he released them. And so, as we do ministry together, church, we, we want to put as much into people as we can. As much of God's word, as much of God's love, as much of God's presence as we can. And that only happens when we first ask ourselves, how much? How much am I willing to sacrifice to serve others? How much am I willing to give up to serve others? I was having a conversation with one of the uh, workers during the week, and we talked about, you know, hey, my yard's starting to look a little scruffy at home because I'm, I'm as soon as, you know, work and go home, change clothes, come back and and some things at home aren't getting done. And, and I got to think, you know, what would I rather invest my time in? Just stuff that I was going to do, stuff that I wanted to do, or the opportunity to come back and hang out with, with these elementary age kids all night long and help be a part of their lives. And part of me, of course, with, with by the time that you're at that time of the day, You'd love just to go home and, and be quiet and watch what you want on TV, especially if Marilyn's here working. I got the remote. I mean, <laughs> but then you realize at the end of the night when you go home, man, what I would give to do this again. Sacrifice is a big word, folks. It has to be in your, your Christian walk. It's a word that has been taken out of the church for the most part in America. We want to talk about what Jesus sacrificed, but we don't want to talk about personal sacrifice. It's unfortunate that many people want to be a part of a church that has a form of success, but without any personal sacrifice along the way. I want to be a part of something that looks successful that I don't have to sacrifice for. I was thankful for many of the workers, and I don't know why, but there was a lot of uh, reminiscing that went on this last week about how long we've been here, or even VBSs in the past when we were at the other facility, and it was just, you know, and, and that's good to think about how much sacrifice went on years ago so that Grandview could be in the position it is today to be able to do the, the ministry that it's doing. And that we have to continue engaging in that idea of personal sacrifice so that we are willing to serve others because here's the here's the clue folks you cannot serve without sacrifice you cannot serve without sacrifice along the way but this is the amazing thing when people see you sacrifice it changes everything when you start to give of your time and give of your energy to serve someone else, it, va it puts value in that individual. It, it opens them up that you can speak and in love into their lives. And it starts to just change the whole environment of those that are around you. It's incredible. And, uh, and so that's why, you know, Jesus said, you know, I've come to lay down my life. I come not to, to be served, but to serve. And then he goes and you start to connect the dots. He tells his disciples... Now, go do, do the ministry that I've done. Do the works that I've done. But also in the sense he's saying, do it the way I have done. Don't go through life looking to be served. Go through life serving others. Now, that doesn't mean that we're the doormat to the world and people just are able to walk all over us. That just means we've got a heart that we look for the needs of other people. And we, by the power of God, we want to meet those needs. Because we love people more than ourselves. And so it has to be a 
an intentional um, culture that we set in our church. And it's set not by just the leadership of your pastor and, and staff and, and elders and their family, but it is by all of us working together and understanding this, by all of us having this desire. Years ago, we, we said it when we were doing the Purpose Driven Life, you know, uh, we're, we're reaching the lost at any cost. And that's a, that's a really nice catchy saying, isn't it? Reaching the lost at any cost. And there's nothing wrong with that saying. But what really stuck me is when I, when I changed it just a little bit, reaching the lost at any personal cost. That makes me pause for a few moments. Because it's not just what can the church invest in. It's not just how much of our, of our percentage of our income do we put towards evangelism. How much of my life do I sacrifice to serve other people, especially those that I'm not going to get anything back? Those little kids that were coming in, we aren't going to get anything back out of them in a sense of they're not going to bring in a lot of money. Uh, they're, they're, they need rides to get here even to church. But that's not why we do it. We do it because we're compelled with the love of God on the inside of us. And so I just want to say again, say, church, thank you uh, for your willingness. But, but that's the way we, we do ministry at Grandview. Don't know how you want to do it, but that's why we are going to do it, is that we reach out and we care for those that are around us, reaching out, loving them. And, uh, and, and, and that's a way, uh, something that God can really bless in our lives. And, uh, and thank you uh, for an incredible week here at Grandview. It uh, is a part of where we have been going in this series on an appeal to heaven. Or we understand that we, we must have God's blessings upon us. Whatever work we do without prayer is like planting without watering. Now, that's probably not a real good illustration now because you can't plant right now because there's too much water. But, but if we plant and we never water the seeds, there really is no expectation that they're going to grow. And we can do all kinds of works, but if we don't pray, there is no watering of the seed, the work that has gone on. I know this weekend is, is Flag Day, and, it, and traditionally uh, uh, the, the flag that we're thinking about is uh, a little different than maybe the one that, um, that we've been showing uh, uh, throughout the weeks of, of this appeal to heaven. Um, but the idea that we're going to ask God's help in our lives, in whatever we're doing, is so important. So we've been looking at prayer as, as an opportunity to release God's power in our lives. We many times come up with our own prayer requests. We come up with our own lists. And there's nothing wrong with asking God for whatever your needs are. But I just want to, over this, this series, just kind of make sure that we've got a biblical list of what we should be praying about. So let's just review real quickly for those maybe that weren't with us the last couple weeks. Just so you see where we're coming from and, and where we're going with this. What does the Bible say that we're supposed to be praying about? Appealing to heaven to? What are we supposed to be asking God to, to be doing here on this earth? Number one, we said we need to be praying for those who persecute us. Matthew 5, Jesus said, But I say unto you, love your enemies and pray, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. We are supposed to love our enemies to the point that we're praying for God to move in their lives. It is the proper heart that we need to be as a follower of Jesus. We need to pray for those that persecute us. People that are doing uh, evil to you. People that are making your life difficult should be on your prayer list for God to move in their lives. Number two, we said we're supposed to pray for your needs. There's nothing wrong with that. Jesus again. In Matthew 6, 8, he says, your father knows what you have need of before you ask him. So it's nothing wrong with asking God. And uh, last week we said our greatest need that we, every one of us have is to trust in God. Regardless of where you're at, regardless of what level you are in economy, regardless of whether you're believing God for, the, for, for rent at the end of the month or, or a loaf of bread at the end of the day, trusting in God is really the greatest need that we have in our lives. Are you trusting in the Lord? is so important for us daily, getting that deep on the inside of us, of a confidence in Him. Number three is what we're looking at today, and that we need to pray for laborers for the harvest. 
praying for labors. These, again, are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and get your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 9. We'll read there in just a few moments. The first night of VBS, uh, one of the first bus that came back, uh, we'll just say didn't have as many children in it as we had hoped. Um, and so uh, I said, well, this, this needs to change. So, so uh, I turned to Tony Cunningham. I said, Tony, you know any kids in your neighborhood that aren't here at VBS? Well, Tony said, well, yeah. So I told Kent, I said, Kent, go get the van keys, get Tony, go fill that van up and bring it back. And so they went and took off and, and came back a little bit later. The doors popped open and kids started unfolding out of that thing and running towards the door and, and, and filling up the, uh, from the van was full and brought them in. And I think most of them came the rest of, most of the rest of the week there. It was a good reminder that um, sometimes we have not because we ask not. And we need to be asking God, not just for, for, the, for the harvest, but for the labors for the harvest. You see, there wasn't a lack of kids to go get. We just needed the go-getters. Amen? There's never, there's never been a lack of harvest. But even in the ministry of Jesus, he needed people that would help bring in the harvest. People that would go out reach out people who had a heart and a care for those that weren't a part of the group that were willing to to reach into the lives of people that were messed up and and weren't acting right and weren't living right and weren't doing right and reach into their lives and to share the love of and compassion of God and to draw them to a savior that can transform into changed lives so we can see that it's important for us that we have a passion like our Lord Jesus Christ, that we're willing to go after them. We're willing to reach out to the people that are around us, to understand that there's going to be personal cost on our side. It costs, when we're talking about praying for labors, it costs for us to pray. Not financially, but it costs our time. It costs effort on our part. It, it takes concentration where I'm going to stop just worrying about these things or praying about those other things. And we need to be praying about the, the harvest that needs to be brought in. And the number one way we pray for that is labors to be sent out to go get them and to bring them in and to share the, the love of Jesus Christ with them and through them. In our prayer time, it's easy for us to pray for a few family members that we know that ain't saved, a few close friends that we know that aren't saved. But then it takes some time for us to start to, to say, Lord, open my heart and my eyes to other individuals that I see them in the spiritual state that they are in. That as I see people on the street, as I see people that I meet in my daily life, that I see them more than, than just a person or a commodity or, or something around me that I might be able to use or someone that annoys me, there's somebody that I need to be praying for that person. That our heart breaks when we look into their eyes and we see that lost person. We look into the window of their soul and we see the power of sin that's controlling their lives. We look into their lives and we can see them as being in someone in bondage and they're, they're hopeless and they're lost. And, and that we are not repelled by them, but the emptiness in them should draw us to them. There should be something in our heart that connects with what's missing in their life. And that's Jesus and his love that wants to reach through us. That's Jesus that wants us, regardless of it's the little children or whether it's adults, we care about them. Listen here to the, word, uh, the life of Jesus, and we know this scripture very well, but, but may the Holy Spirit stir it afresh on the inside of us. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Matthew 9, 35, and Jesus traveling through all the towns and villages of the area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless. Folks, you cannot look over, this, over our, the crowds of our, of our world today without seeing Confusion and helplessness. They're confused. 
Someone tell us what's right and what's wrong. They're confused. Someone tell us, who am I? What am I? I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out who I am and what I am. They're helpless. They feel like they're being manipulated and, and deceived along the way. And we need Jesus to come alive in front of them through us. He was moved with compassion to them like sheep without a shepherd. You see, when people are confused and people are helpless, they, they feel vulnerable in their lives. They don't feel safe. What is it that you're hearing a lot, especially in, the, in America, but, but we're seeing it around the world? People don't feel safe anymore. This is a great time to share with Jesus. Because Jesus will bring safety into your life. The harvest, he said to his disciples, is great. But the laborers are few. Notice what Jesus said to pray for. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers to his fields. How often do you find yourself praying this? How often do you find yourself praying over our city, praying over our nation? God, send labors. God, send thrust forth your labors into your harvest. God, you know the right people. You know, you know your people that need to get stirred up. You see, there's a lot of laborers right here sitting in this congregation this morning. There's a lot of Tony Cunninghams that, that should be willing to jump in a van and go do whatever needs to be done. But we're, we, we need the thrusting power of the Holy Spirit to stir us on the inside. I'm not here to make you feel guilty. I'm not here to make you feel bad. I'm not here to tell you that if you don't go and win someone to Jesus today, their very blood will be upon your hands. And when you go before the Lord Jesus Christ, and if that person is in hell, you will sense the loss in your life. And doesn't that make you feel like you want to go share Jesus with somebody? I'm not here to make you feel bad. I'm not here to try to motivate you with guilt. I'm here to liberate you with the truth to know that, this, that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good and healing all the oppressed of the devil. And people were attracted to his message. They were attracted to the power of God and the love of God in his life. There was no problem getting a crowd with Jesus. There was a problem getting crowd people to help him with the crowd, to be to, be, to, to sense the same Spirit of God. If you've got the Holy Spirit in your life, you've got the compassion of God to reach the lost. You can't have the Holy Ghost without a compassion for the lost because He is the Spirit of harvest. He is the Spirit of God that stirs on the inside. And yes, there's sometimes evangelists. And yes, there's sometimes those that God uses more in this area. But God wants every single one of us to pray, God, send forth laborers into his harvest. You might tell me that's not my gifting, but you can't tell me it's not God's desire for you to spend time praying for laborers to be sent. You can excuse yourself from door-to-door -door witnessing. You can excuse yourself from going to a foreign country. You can excuse yourself from some of these things, but you can't get away from these words of Jesus. Pray for the Lord of the harvest. Pray to send people into those fields that are right. Verse uh, 1 of the next chapter, Jesus goes on and Jesus calls his 12 disciples and gives unto them uh, the authority to cast out evil spirits and heal every kind of diseases and illnesses, and he sends them out and the power of the Holy Spirit. The thought that I, we want to simply get through to us today is that Jesus wants to, use every, wants to use us in different ways, yes, but he wants to use every one of us to pray, every one of us to believe God, every one of us to ask for God to move supernaturally in this world. 
Folks, America is not going in the right direction. And the best thing for America is not a, a new direction. It's not for new hope. It's not for new leadership. It is for a revival. It is for the Spirit of God to move upon this nation. And the best thing for America would be for the church to start to pray and ask God to send forth laborers into the harvest of America. Folks, we can get discouraged or we can say, America is in the worst spiritual shape it's been for a long time. So there's a lot of people that can be saved. It's a big harvest out there, folks. You don't have to look far to find a sinner. Amen? So what are we going to do about it? Are we going to just talk about them? Are we going to look at them at how hopeless they are, how confused they are, how, 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 how they're looking for some security? Or can we fall on our knees and start to spend some quality time? Holy Ghost, send forth labors. Not just someone to Uncle Joe, not just someone to my kid who should know, but God send it out into some of these people. Go ahead and lay out some of these magazines that you see. Uh, lay out some of these things that are going on. These confused people that, that don't even know their, their, their gender, don't even know who they are in life. Folks, we can criticize them or we can start to pray for them. We can start to believe God. Church, Church needs to be more relevant. We need to talk about more some of the social issues that are going on in the world around us. Folks, we need to be more spiritual relevant. And, not, and talking about how we're going to reach out. We're going to love all people. Here's the message for the church. You might want to write this down. This is the message we need to be telling the world. This is the message we need to tell these confused people that are around us in the world. You're wrong. But we love you anyway. And we want to bring you into the truth of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. People, if you're going the wrong way, we don't want people to encourage you. Hey, just give it a good try. If I'm driving the wrong direction, will someone please tell me? Don't just encourage me. Not just hope you're finding out along the way. Not just hope that sometime if he goes far enough, he'll turn around. Folks, encourage me. Tell me. Just simply tell me, you're wrong. Would you say that for me, please? Say it with a little conviction. But I love you. Can you say that with more conviction? I'm a little nervous on that one. <laughs> We're not saying it to, to belittle anyone. We're not saying it to criticize anyone. We're saying to help everyone. But we need to pray. What do we need to pray? We need to pray for labors. We need to pray for labors, not just, a, not just warm bodies to be thrown out there, not just, not just a group of, of Christians that go to a certain church that all have on the same t-shirt that are out there in the street, and so they all look like they kind of are the same group and that nobody else can be a part of them. We need to pray for specific God-ordained, God, God-empowered God used individuals that whether you got your Grandview t-shirt on or not, that God can use you. And they're in, in the spiritual realm, there's something about you that draws people to you. There's something the way that you're living that makes you stick out from everybody else. It, it, it's not whether or not, you, it's not so much what you're doing, but there's but there's just something about you that, that makes me want to want to ask you some questions and, and get closer to you. There's a magnetism that draws people to you. It, it is the light that's on the inside of us that is not hidden, but, but the world sees and draws into our life. We need some labors like Jesus spoke of here. And so in just a few moments, I want to pull out just a couple of these points. That, that I want us to be praying. At, at, at least today, would you pray? I mean, if Jesus asked you to pray, would you please pray? This pastor is asking you to pray. Would you please pray? And do what the, what the Lord is saying. I know it's going to cost you some time. I know it's going to cost you some, 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 some uh, giving of yourself. And as you start to, to pray for the lost, I know that the, the compassion of the Holy Ghost starts to get a hold of your life. And there, there's some, some holy fire conviction that you really want to watch TV, but you're sensing the Holy Spirit says, but I want you to pray a little bit more. And I know you want to go play another round of golf. And the Holy Spirit is saying, yeah, but I want, you, I want you to stop and just pray a little bit more. Well, I can pray in golf at the same time, Lord Jesus. You help me get this one in, help me get, oh uh, yeah, we get all consumed with ourselves, me, myself, and I. 
We forget about the world that's dying and, and sin that is around us. So Jesus says, pray for, pray for what? Pray for laborers. Number one, pray for laborers who are sent by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, so pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors. Yeah, that, those two words, send forth, that, that, that it's more than just an invitation to be in part of something. It is, a, it is the idea of being thrust out, not, not, not pushed over the cliff necessarily, but like a, a rocket when it takes off, there's thrust that is behind that. Jesus said, I don't need just warm bodies out there. I need people that are being thrust by the power of the Holy Spirit. I need people that, that sense that there is something, something of a greater force behind them than what is in front of them. Because we, we, in spirit, we encounter spiritual opposition when we start to share our faith with the world around us. We encounter demonic opposition when we start to share our faith with those that are around us. And Jesus is letting us know it's not just having five good answers for any question people ask you. It is having the power of the Holy Spirit that is behind you, that is thrusting you forth, and you sense his presence, you sense his mission that he has called you to be a part of, and you're going forth. The Amplified Translation says in verse 38, So pray the Lord of the harvest to force out and thrust labors into his field. Your body never wants to share Christ with people around you. Your emotions are always afraid you're going to be rejected. People are always concerned that, that maybe I'm going to get hurt. You know, you're reading through your devotional as people that share their faith in, in other countries of the world are being beaten. They're being beheaded. They're being uh, thrown out of their homes. Their children are being massacred in front of them. Why would they continue to live this way? Because there is a thrusting behind them that understands that this world is not where I'm at. And I've got to live for Christ every day of my life. I've got to be a living witness. I have to be a life and a light to those that are around me. It is of necessity in the way that I live. And I pray that this church, that there's a thrusting out of you from this place. There's a, there's a leaving this place thinking not just the sermon was good, but I got to go tell somebody about Jesus this week. I got to live like Jesus this week. I got to look for an opportunity to share Christ with those that are around me. This ain't just did I get enough through me that I can live another week. This isn't just, you know, God, are you going to be happy enough with me so that, it, you know, if I forget God, if I've got any sin in my life, you won't deal with it. This is going forth in our lives, sensing the presence of the Holy Spirit, sending us out into the world that is around us, a commissioning of us, a thrusting of us, a pushing of us presence of God in our lives, moved with compassion. Jesus, in verse 36, seeing the crowd, he was moved with compassion. I don't want us just to say, well, I, we got this many people saved. It's wonderful in one sense. I, I don't, I don't, don't misunderstand me. But I want us to be moved with compassion. We got one saved. This one came to know Jesus. Move with compassion for the 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 the, the, the goal is not how many I got it. The goal is not I, I beat you by five. The goal is not the trophy that I got today is the as the top one. The, the goal is, is not how many that, that I brought. But there's a compassion on the inside of it. There's a compassion that we reach out to people with. There's an authenticity about us that we really care about people, that we're not just trying to get more people in the church. We're not just trying to get more people in the pews. We're not just trying to get more people to give money. We're not just trying to get more people to like us. Like me on Facebook, so I'll be have a, you know, a higher ranking. Like Grandview on Facebook, so we'll be more important. No, folks, this is a dying, a never ending, it'd be a better way, compassion on the inside of us that we must reach the harvest because we love them. We love people. 
We love them so much we don't want them to be lost. That's where the church has messed up sometimes is we've made a list of right and wrong, but we don't love people along the way. I love you. You might be wrong, but I still love you. You might even have done me wrong, but I'm still going to love you. You may be making my life difficult, but I am still going to love you along the way. It's incredible when we start to live that way. Like our Lord Jesus, he didn't look at the crowd and say, look at the crowd, look at the crowd. All of them here to see me. Now he started to see their needs. He started to see the needs of the people. He was moved with compassion. I want everyone that comes to this church to feel the love and compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want everyone in this church then to go out and to spread that compassion to the world that is around us. That we're willing to share the life and life and love of Jesus. Because we understand, we see the real condition of people. Matthew 9, 36, he, he had compassion because he'd seen their condition. They were sheep without a shepherd. They were weary, they were troubled, they were fearful, they were scared, they were paranoid. They, they were looking for help and hope and, and religion had disappointed them and, and the Pharisees had, had abused them and, 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 the, and the Romans were oppressing them and, and they're just, they're, 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 their economy had bottomed out. There's nothing that they could find for hope and they're looking to Jesus and Jesus seen their condition. Part of our prayer for the labors are sent out. May, we, may they have eyes to see the condition of people. And we're not afraid of it, but we meet it. We see the condition of people. Some people say, well, so-and-so, they're, 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 a, they're an addict over there. i got to stay away from people like that. If you're walking around the house with a cell phone in your hand hoping somebody might call you, you may be an addict. If, if you start to leave the house... But, uh, but go back to get your cell phone because it makes you feel more comfortable and safe, you may be an addict. If you're driving down the road and you know it's dangerous if someone sends you a text message, but you got to read it, even though you know it may cause an accident and it's illegal, you may have a problem. You may be an addict. If you do read that message and it's something like, can you do lunch with me next Thursday? And you're reading down on as you're driving down, driving down the road. And you feel like you need to respond right then. You may be an addict. You see, we got to see the condition of people that are around us. And we don't say that some are acceptable and some aren't and But we just simply say, I need to see what people's needs are, and I want to meet it in the power of Jesus' name. I think that's funny, and I was one of our youth beforehand about, you know, going to camp, and they were saying, well, I can't take my phone with me. You know, as I was a kid, never did we try to get a long enough cord (laughs) on our phone home to be able to take it with us. When we went somewhere, we become addicted to things, whatever they might be in our life. We need to pray for labors that since the thrusting power of the Holy Spirit, since the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ, and they see the conditions of people that are around us. I only use that illustration because I want you to know people are messed up. But Jesus can fix us up. It's not my responsibility to fix you up. And I'm not going to go hang around with just people that, that look fixed up, but they're really messed up. They don't even know they're messed up. At least the messed up people know they're messed up. And they're really the easier ones to fix up. Amen? Because they wake up we won't go any far with that, or you'll get upset. But anyway, this is what we're saying, folks. 
Are you praying for labors like this? Because these are labors that can make a difference in reaching the harvest in our day and age. It's really the same. So my second question is, are you willing to be a labor like this? Are you willing to be the answer to the prayer? Are you willing to sense the thrusting power of the Holy Spirit in your life? Are you willing to walk in the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ? Are you willing to see the real condition of people around you? And still reach out to them. Still love them. Still bring them to Jesus. Because he needs you to do the work. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit.